We're going to continue things with uh, another excellent presentation from Eve. I'm really looking forward to this one. Uh, she's one of the many authors of The Lifecycle Trade, a fantastic exploration of IPOs and super growth stocks. And she's also one of the excellent educators as a part of the IPO masterclass, which we completed earlier this year. So thank you guys so much for tuning in. Uh, if you're enjoying the stream, please go ahead and leave a like down below. Uh, and Eve, thank you so much for being a part of this. And I'm really looking forward to this. Thanks for having me, Richard. I'm very excited. I hear there's a, a big group and we're streaming live, so should be great. Uh, and everyone can participate later for Q&A as well. I'm very excited to be here. And depending, I guess, on where you are in the world, either good morning, I have my coffee, good afternoon, or good evening. I don't know, it might be in the middle of the night, right, for some people. So thanks so much for, for joining us today. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about trading the IPO advance phase. Uh, as Richard mentioned, uh, we did a lot of research on IPOs and super growth stocks and how they behave. So I'll give you a little bit of background as well, just to bring everyone up to the same um, page in terms of the life cycle trade and what we're going to talk about in the different phases. So we'll do a little bit of a brief overview as well. And uh, really, I'm going to hone in on talking about the uh, early life cycle of an IPO when it first starts trading. But before we get started, a little bit of a disclaimer, please read this at your leisure. But basically the content today that I'm presenting is for just informational and educational purposes only. I think everyone understands that um, IPOs, super growth stocks and the financial markets involve um, a huge amount of risk and it's very possible to lose uh, money. So really see the advice from a professional, a financial professional prior to implementing any investment program or um, financial plan. Uh, I want to point out that, you know, if you wish to apply any of the concepts that I'm going to be talking about, um, of course, you're doing so at your own risk. I mean, they work for me, but they may not work for everyone for your particular situation. And um, also, I'm going to try to remember to mention if we talk about stocks um, that I have positions in. But keep in mind that some of the names that we're going to talk about today, uh, we may have uh, positions in currently. Okay. And please read through the disclaimer later at your leisure. So let's talk about uh, the agenda for today. I wanted to start out uh, today talking about uh, and honoring um, my mentor, Bill O'Neill, and sharing with you a few lessons that I've learned. Bill um, was an extraordinary person. Um, and a legendary trader. And I was very, very lucky to, to call him my mentor over the years. So um, I'm going to share with you some information there. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about the current market, just my view. And then, um, as I mentioned, a brief overview of the life cycle advantage, which is the edge that we feel that we gained with the research that we did on IPOs going back to the 80s. And I want to give a shout out to that team, uh, Kathy Donnelly, Eric Kroll, uh, and Kurt Dale um, worked with me on that. We worked as a team and we never would have been able to accomplish uh, what we did without that power of the team. And then I'm going to hone in, as I mentioned, on the early life cycle. Um, I trade uh, both phases, both the early phase of IPOs, as well as the more mature phase and mature stocks. But uh, today we're going to hone in on that fast moving <laughs> IPO advanced phase. I think um, the traders that have shorter time frames are going to, to enjoy this as well. I'm going to share some stats that we haven't shared yet, just some preliminary information about the IPO advance phase for IPOs over the last few years, and then talk about how I get positioned in an IPO during this fast moving phase, and talk about how I manage the expectations for the trade, as well as some of my favorite sell rules and uh, the risk management practices that I use, because these can be very volatile phases. So very important um, is solid risk management. And since we've recently turned, I mean, we've had a bear market for uh, a long time now, and we recently turned and, and have been rallying, there's a favorite screen that I have after a bear market. And uh, it's really, 
identifies like anecdotally over the years I've been running it uh, at major market turns and it tends to identify, you know, one, two, a couple of the new leaders um, of a rally. So I'm going to share with you the, re the recent results of that screen as well. Okay, and uh, let's jump right in. On the right here, I shared a picture with you. Um, this is a picture of a desk plaque that we made for Bill O'Neill uh, about nine years back. And it says, a master teacher's influence ripples through eternity. Thank you, Bill, for sharing your knowledge. And we shared that with him at a dinner uh, in Santa Monica uh, in, years ago and really just wanted to provide him with a gift that really talked about how much we value his sharing, his education, his knowledge with us, his experience. Um, it's just phenomenal how he's impacted so many people's lives. I've heard a lot of testimonials, and I'm sure there's going to be a lot more um, coming out as well. Um, I'm going to try not to choke up here. I, I wanted to um, mention that I also included at the top my favorite quotes from Bill. Um, and some of you may have heard me before talk about this, but the first quote, by the best companies with great earnings coming out of bases, um, that was when I first met Bill and I had his book and I was like brave and went up there and introduced myself and we started talking and I, I asked him, you know, could you give me advice for a new trader? And that's what he wrote. So um, what a great sentence that encompasses so much that's important in terms of trading um, grow stocks successfully. And another one of my favorites is your job is to find the next apple and handle it well. Um, one of the things that Bill was phenomenal at is always finding the next best leader. Like he, whenever you talk to him and we were in a bull market, you knew that he would have um, the top leader. So some way he would always find a way into those leaders. And Bill was always so positive, encouraging others. Um, he always encouraged me. And, you know, he'd sign my, I always attended seminars like every year uh, and would have a chance to chat with Bill. And he would sign a lot of times my seminar books. You can do it, you know, no matter what the market conditions were, he was always uh, positive. So some of the lessons that I've learned from Bill over the years, just to never give up. I mean, I think everyone's experienced this uh, bear market lately, it can get very frustrating. And we're going to have more in the future. And so it's easy to sometimes get frustrated and feel like this is not for me. I want to give up. Bill would always um, be an optimist and say, you know, this will this will pass and we'll have great opportunities in the future. Bill also had a tremendous uh, work ethic. He worked very, very hard. You'll probably hear stories from people that worked very close with him. And, you know, he they would be talking on Sundays. He would be always studying the past historical leaders, studying his past trades, um, learning from all of that. So even as he became very, very successful, he never dropped that really strong work ethic. So that's one thing that I always try to keep in mind and um, always work hard. And I mentioned regarding the leader, I would go to the seminars every year, as I mentioned before, and uh, I would always ask Bill, you know, I'd be raising my hand, Bill, how do you know which stock that you have is the big leader so that you can handle it well and hold on to that one? Because I, you know, I would always try carefully to pick out the best stocks in the market, um, but it's hard to tell which one is going to be the big leader. So he did share with me a couple of things. Well, we all know, even when we look at all the fundamentals and the technicals, you know, some of the stocks are going to be big leaders in our portfolio. Others are not. Um, he, he really looked, focused on price movement. You know, once you have um, a, a good portfolio with a lot of strong stocks, which stock is the best performing so far from where you bought it, or maybe like the second best, that pure price power is showing you that's a potential powerful leader. And the other thing that he shared with me is that he liked to actually define ahead of time for those leaders 
what type of a core position he would like to hold on to. Because he said, once you start selling um, a stock, let's say you're just trimming back, it's pulling back in the moment, you may like oversell and then suddenly you find yourself, you're totally out of that position. So he tried to set that up in advance. And finally, in terms of the charts and technical analysis versus fundamental analysis, um, Bill used both. I would say he was more of a fundamentalist. He liked to really know the company that he was buying. And one of the things that he stressed is we're using the technicals to time the buys and sells of an exceptional company. We're not just buying a chart. So really knowing the company that you're investing in. And finally, staying humble and giving back to others. I try to follow that. Um, Bill was always sharing his um, expertise and experience and knowledge so freely uh, with all of us. So um, I try to do the same. Okay, next let's talk about the, um, the current market. So what I'm sharing with you here is a weekly chart of the NASDAQ. And just what I like to do is just look at the current uh, trend and try to stay with the trend. So, you know, we've obviously had a severe uh, bear market in the NASDAQ. Um, for growth stocks, it started even earlier, back in like February of 2021. Um, the NASDAQ later in 2021, there was a significant, and it's been a long bear market, long and drawn out. But right now, we have rallied. So in October, the market tried to bottom. In December, it kind of tried to retest that area. And since around January 6th, there was a follow through on the NASDAQ. For those of you that follow the William O'Neill follow through system, you know, it's a strong price move on a larger volume than the day before. And that started a rally. And so far, that's intact. So um, you can see that, you know, there are a lot of mega cap technology names that have had very strong moves and are doing well. Also, technology as a sector is doing well. So um, in terms of feedback on the portfolio, when I'm buying new positions, they're starting to work. So all of that feedback is, you know, the market's in rally mode. Who knows how long it's going to last? Um, but so far, so good. It's looking, it's looking good. There's a leading um, sector as well. You know, artificial intelligence. We'll talk a little bit about that and the companies that may benefit from that. Um, so um, the one thing I have down here is a quote from our book. And uh, we'll look at the IPO ETF in a second. But very important, especially for um, early cycle names, uh, we want to only trade with the trend and not trade uh, risky, volatile IPO names uh, during a bear market. Um, and I'm sure many of you know how severely these names were hit uh, during this recent bear. So not fighting the trend, very, very important. Okay, this is the IPO Renaissance ETF. It's a weekly chart. I should mention all of the charts that I'm using are WANDA, a William O'Neill and Company charts. And I have, um, I don't think I included a legend, but the main lines here on the weekly that I'm using are the 40 week um, and the 10 weeks. So the 10 weeks in red and the 40 weeks in black. Okay, so uh, you can see that this particular IPO ETF, the Renaissance ETF, uh, corrected and significantly, and it's still 60% off its all-time highs. However, it has been participating in the rally year to date. It's up 24%. Uh, it rallied off the bottom. It's consolidating and it's trying uh, to move out of there. So that's something that I monitor along with, I don't have a chart of it, but I, I watch the uh, the Russell Growth um, ETF as well um, to see how that's performing. One thing I wanted to mention, these stats are pretty interesting. So if you think back, you know, 2021, that's when the bear market started. Well, that year we had a record number of IPOs and SPACs, over a thousand, if you count them all up. And um, what's interesting is that that shows frothiness. And usually when you start setting records in terms of a high number of IPOs going public, that could signal 
a market top, and certainly it did in 2021. Now, if you think about the action since then, um, the number of IPOs going public has really significantly declined. So slow in 2022. And so far this year, if you look at just IPOs, like what Renaissance Capital reports um, on their website, there's like 44 IPOs that have gone public. So still slow. But what's interesting, when you look back at history, a low number of IPOs, typically you see that during bear markets. And um, then you still see that when the market turns, because there's a lag in terms of the rebound in IPO activity, because companies are concerned about going public during bad market conditions. So just something to keep an eye on. Let's see when that turns. But it's important to keep in mind that it does lag the market. Okay, this is a summary of um, the edge that we feel that we gained from studying all of the IPOs back from the 80s. And it's kind of like a nice acronym, LIVES, in terms of just catchy so that you can remember all of the aspects of it. And I'm gonna share with you just very briefly the life cycle advantage. So first, it's the life cycle phases. Every IPO, nearly every IPO, goes through three distinct phases, and we're gonna talk about those. We also discovered when we studied all of these charts, all of these IPOs, we discovered six different patterns. I'm not gonna go through those in detail today. We cover all of this material in significant detail in the IPO masterclass that Richard mentioned that we did with the Trader Lion recently. So, um, and it's also uh, in our book. Volume is very important. So what we found is liquidity matters and it makes a difference in terms of the success of an IPO. And we're looking for quite a few IPOs can be disappointments. And I'll show you that pattern as well. Um, people don't like to talk about that, but it's true. So really we wanna be selective and we wanna look for the exceptional companies. We're looking for the disruptors the transformative companies with huge growth drivers for the future. And also we found that there's different cell rules. We tested out the cell rules. Different cell rules work better in different phases. And we'll talk a little bit about um, which cell rules I like to apply during the fast IPO advance phase. Uh, but again, these are all covered in more detail in the materials that I mentioned. So what is the life cycle trade? It's really understanding where a stock is in its run from the IPO through to the mature stock. And it's using the appropriate rules, as I mentioned, the appropriate cell rules and risk management practices uh, for that particular phase, as well as the pattern. Okay, so what are the phases? Very quickly, you have the IPO advance phase. That's typically when the stock goes public, um, it has, you know, it may form a, a short base pretty quickly and move up for a short period of time. And uh, that's usually short lived and usually reverses. And we're going to go through quite a few examples today that I've put together for you so that we study how those uh, leaders behaved. And then there's an institutional due diligence space typically. This is where the stock is changing hands. If it's a high quality company that institutions wanna accumulate, you're gonna see a transition from shorter traders to institutional investors. And this will take time usually. We notice that um, it can take six months, 18 months, even longer. And this is a phase where this, like a watch phase, and uh, the stock is gonna go sideways to down for this period of time. And what we're watching for is like a first mature base and some accumulation to start coming into the name. Okay, and then the other phase, not every stock has this phase, but for high quality names, they're gonna have an institutional advance phase, we noticed in our research. And this is usually a longer phase where midterm to long-term sell rules could work better in this phase. And so it's, um, it's different in terms of which strategies a trader might want to um, apply here. So like if I'm trading a name that's coming out of a mature base, that's already gone through this institutional due diligence phase, 
I may have that in mind. This could be early. This is if it's a high quality company. So I may use different rules for that. And we found that in our research, those rules are more effective. Okay, so this is a line chart of Tesla. Just let, let's just go through this very quickly. So here you're, you're seeing that the IPO advance phase of Tesla. So it's pretty short lived. It forms a little um, IPO base and moves out, has a nice run. Um, as I mentioned before, a lot of it, you know, that run is given back. That's typical. And then you have this long period of time where uh, the stock is going sideways to down. And that's the due diligence phase that I mentioned. You know, the institutions may be researching the name um, and then starting to nibble if it's a high quality name. Now, Typically, we'll see resistance at this previous high from the IPO advance phase. So if you see that here um, and take it all the way out, that's this dotted line. We call that the turbulence zone. And you can see when Tesla tried to come out, it did get some turbulence there. Okay, and then for those high quality names, they're going to have an institutional advance phase typically. And for Tesla, it was obviously a very super powerful move, but that shows the institutional advance phase. And um, Tesla is a late bloomer. So that's this first pattern. And a late bloomer typically is a name that takes quite a while to get going in the institutional advance phase, but it does have usually a successful little IPO um, advance phase. Now, pump and dump is, um, I would say the iconic super growth stock example of that is uh, Facebook Meta, you know, where it met a lot of selling when it first went public, um, and then finally went through the due diligence phase and had its institutional advance. Now, one hit wonders, if you look at the charts of recent growth names, uh, many of them look like this chart. So think of like an upside down B. And the reason for that is the severity of the bear market. So names that try to move, um, went through that huge IPO advance phase, some of them successfully in like, let's say the 2020 time frame, have given back a lot of that move and then some. So you'll see a lot of those patterns. These patterns at the bottom that we discovered rocket ship and stair stepper those are rare patterns um, if you think of rocket ship maybe upstarts initial move um, and uh, back in the late 90s ebay those are some of the examples stair steppers very very rare this just stair steps along doesn't really have an institutional due diligence phase it just kind of starts right away and goes into an institutional advance phase and a good example of that historically is uh, Google or Alphabet. Now, disappointments, unfortunately, a lot of names fall into this category. And then you just stop hearing about them, right? So a lot of um, IPOs are not successful. So that's why we want to be selective and look for those exceptional companies. Okay. All right. Well, let's dive into the early phase trading um, for the IPO advance phase. And I shared with you on this slide what I look for for the IPO base. Okay, so you could take a second to read through that. So I'm looking, the characteristics that I'm looking for, I'm looking for a base to start forming pretty quickly because that's going to be signaling demand to me. Like so if it can form a short base and then move out pretty quickly for that IPO advance phase, um, people are not really interested in selling the name. So I'm looking for that. Typically the IPO base I'm looking for, it can be pretty short. It can be two weeks or longer. And some, some of the patterns that I like to trade are the U-shaped bases, and I'm going to show you a few examples, um, what, what we've dubbed the hook pattern. And then sometimes they just form short consolidations or possibly even like high tight flags, um, and uh, I, I would trade those as well. I'm looking for strong revenue growth and liquidity. Those are so important because um, the, the stock has to have enough liquidity for me to be able to get in and out of the name. And uh, also, I'm um, being selective. I'm looking for, I'm trying to look for the next leaders. Okay. In terms of technical analysis, I'm going to take note of any tight action. 
Um, that is rare with an IPO. So when I see it, um, I'm thinking accumulation. And similarly, I'm going to be looking for the price closes to be strong. Um, while the stock may be volatile intraday from a technical perspective, I'm going to focus more on how it closes. And I'm going to pay attention when I'm trading this phase, I'm going to pay more attention to daily charts, just a faster time frame. And the moving averages that I'm going to be using are typically the 21-day EMA, if it's there already. And if it's not present, then the 10-day simple moving average. While a shallow correction is ideal, it's rare, right? Because IPOs are more volatile. But if I see that, um, I, that's going to be a plus. And also, I'm going to consider the market environment. If we were in a bear and the IPO base was forming during a bear, then I'm going to give that more leeway because I'm going to expect a deeper consolidation. I'm going to be watching for liquidity to pick up as well as it tries to come out of the IPO base. And successive days closing up, uh, I would say Google is a perfect example of that. Alphabet back when it first came out, if you want to study that pattern, um, you can just see the accumulation on the right side as it tries to come out of its base. And one thing I look for on the technicals, and I look for this in any base, even on mature stocks, is I want to see a faster recovery than a decline. So let's say if the stock's correcting for a couple of weeks, then when it starts to reverse and come up the right side, I want to see that left side price taken out very quickly, faster than the right, the left side decline. Not, that's not always present, but when I see it, these are all positives. Okay, so the first example I have for trading the IPO advanced space is uh, Mobileye. Um, I'm not going to go through my trades in detail on any of these examples. Uh, I did go through a lot of detail in the IPO masterclass, but I, what I wanted to focus on today to show you is just how these IPO advanced phases behave. Now, I did trade this name. It's one of my most successful um, trades this year so far, and I, tr I am not currently in the stock. Okay, so I want to show you the hook patterns here. There's an early hook pattern here, and then there's a second hook pattern, okay? And typically, when I'm looking for this U-shaped pattern, it tends to coincide as well with the moving averages. So if you look here, um, the 21-day EMA, the 10-day EMA, those are other moving averages you can use to get positioned. So what I'm trying to do in this phase is I'm trying to get positioned near the turn early because these names are so volatile. Take a look at this. It's very easy to get stopped out. And um, I get stopped out regularly. So when I'm starting to get positioned, this is why I keep my stop losses very tight, tight risk management. When I'm trading these types of names, my expectation is that I may get stopped out once or twice before I get positioned. So that's normal. I wanted to point out here, just because this is still on the watch list, whenever I trade a name that um, was successful in the IPO advance phase, I keep it on a watch list and I'm watching it for later to see if it can come out, go through some type of consolidation, and then move out. So this was very interesting. This was that huge earnings gap, which was terrible, right? But look at the close. So that gets my attention, the fast positive reversal. Let's see what it can do now. I would say it's still in the IPO advanced phase, but I mean, it did have obviously this little aberration, but it had a, a nice strong positive close. So I'm watching it. We don't know what it's gonna do, but it's one for the watch list. Okay, here's another name that I wanted to show you in terms of the IPO advance phase. Very quick. One thing that you can see from all of these examples is they run up quickly and then they correct quickly. So another hook pattern, you know, a trader could use that to start to get positioned and use the moving averages and get a little bit of a lower cost basis 
to withstand these kind of pullbacks. While they just look like blips on the screen, these are, you know, some of these are pretty wide swings. So uh, that's why during this phase, I want to get positioned with a lower cost basis. And I'm not going to be, I'm going to try not to add to the position. I don't want to raise my cost basis. So you can see how quickly this move occurred, kind of like an island top, right? It never hit that um, price again during this phase, at least for now. And then it gave back the entire move. Again, typical. So that's why these faster rules uh, are more successful in this phase. And you can see all these examples. That's why I put these examples together for you today. Now, whenever uh, I trade an IPO advanced phase, or even if I don't, and I see that it had one and then kind of corrected and is starting to go down to sideways. Now, this is pretty severe, again, because of the uh, bear market. I'm going to be watching this and putting it on a watch list. And what I'm looking for is I'm looking for, you know, first, usually this length of time, I'm being patient. You know, usually it's six months, 18 months, maybe a little longer. And then I'm looking for a constructive first mature base to form. So uh, with a rally before that. And um, then you can see with on holdings, uh, it did stage a breakout here from that first mature base. So now I'm watching, I'm not in this name currently. Uh, I did trade it before. So now I'm watching to see what it does here. Is it gonna create another base? Um, no one knows, right? But it's on the watch list. Okay, Airbnb, very similar, trading this IPO advance phase if someone's trading them. Again, the hook pattern could be used here. Look at this volatility. That's why, you know, trying to buy regular breakouts during the IPO advance phase is very difficult. And the odds of being stopped out are even higher than, than um, some of these other entry points. Again, you can see, at least in my experiences anecdotally, okay, you can see that uh, it gives back the entire run and it's pretty fast. Um, negative reversals I'm pointing out, I watch for those. Um, when I'm trading this phase, I'm looking to sell a lot into strength and I'm using the shorter term moving averages. I don't know if I pointed those out. So this light green is a 10 day, the magenta is the 21 day EMA. Um, the red is 50. This wine colored, I, I don't really use it that much. I, I put that on there, but that's the 50 e EMA if anyone is interested. Okay, and this gave back the entire uh, move. Again, so now uh, going through an institutional due diligence phase after this advance, if it ever gets up to this spot again, it would get some turbulence there. So I always mark that. And um, now it's, you know, attempting a first base. We'll see what it does. I included uh, lifetime holdings. Um, because it's now setting up a first mature base, even though this IPO advance phase, it was pretty thin. So this doesn't meet the criteria. Typically we're looking for, you know, 20 million at least average daily. But anyway, you can see that this had a short consolidation, moved out, same pattern, negative reversal, and then gives back uh, that entire quick move. But now um, I have this on a watch list. I'm familiar with the company. That's that's something that I always try to do. Um, I always try to get familiar with the company and experience it firsthand if I can. So I work out at Lifetime Fitness. Um, and so let's see. So you've got this institutional due diligence phase, and now it's attempting a first mature base. I mean, we'll see what happens. No one knows. Um, only the, you know, only in terms of the turbulence zone here is one area to keep a close eye on because if the stock can power through that and hold that level, it's going to be showing some strength. So we don't know what it's going to do yet, but just taking note of this first mature pace. It's a little on the thin side too. Okay, uh, the next example is Palantir. One thing that's unusual about Palantir that I wanted to mention is that 
it meets the qualifications uh, or met the qualifications for a rare jewel during its IPO advance phase. And we talk about that um, in, in our book in more detail, but basically it's a move that occurs uh, over 100% move within 90 days. And what that does is that puts the stock on a special watch list to watch the institutional due diligence phase. And the reason for that is that we found in our research that these stocks are more likely to increase and have a big, bigger move, but not all of them. So usually it points to maybe one or two leaders. Like if you think back and look back, I think Twilio was on that um, rare jewel way, way, way back when, um, and some other names. So some of them will not work, but uh, it does create a good list for the watch list to keep an eye on to see if they can move out. Okay, so you could see here with Palantir, it created this small little base, which almost looks like some type of cup and handle, short little IPO base, um, and then had quite a run. I mean, it did have this negative reversal, so more than likely a trader would get taken out there, and then it does make another high before rolling over. And it's been going through a due diligence phase for some time now, right? More than two years, along with the market. And then it real, tries to rally off the bottom and has this little maybe double bottom kind of base that forms and it does break out from that. So I, I do currently uh, have a position in this name. It's on theme for artificial intelligence. And I just wanted to show you um, that uh, volume that came in on the daily and the weekly. A couple of things that catch my attention um, first, it's on theme, uh, which uh, is a strong theme, the artificial intelligence. And also, it stages a very strong gap on earnings. So on May 9th, um, it had a powerful move over 23% and 562% gain in volume. So typically, some institutions are starting to take notice when you see that kind of accumulation. And if you look at the weekly, this is the weekly chart. Um, you can see the number of weeks. Of course, here it's extended now. And I'm not sure if you could see this on the weekly. If you look very closely here, there's a line where there are some tight, pretty tight closes in there weekly. So that always catches my attention before this kind of um, final shakeout, before the breakout. Now, I included this name, you'll see later, it, it shows up on one of the screens. Um, it's it's a thinner name, it's a recent IPO, um, it's in the solar industry, which some of the solar names have been doing um, well. The, but the reason I'm showing this chart is you can see how easy it is to get shaken out in this phase. So um, that needs to be the expectation going in. So if anyone was trying to buy here, you know, thinking this was some type of a buy point, you know, you're going to get sh shaken out at least a couple times um, trying to get positioned in a name like this. And even I'm going to show you some lines here from some resistant points. Um, the reason that I try to get lower cost bases, let's say you're buying in here or here or here. These as you start getting higher, it's it's easier and easier um, to get stopped out of these names because of the wide intraday swings. So this is just one that's on the watch list for liquidity to pick up because it shows up on um, one of my screens. So this, these are the new stats that I wanna share with you. Now, uh, uh, a lot of caveats. This is a very small sample size. I just looked at IPOs that are liquid IPOs um, back from 2020. Now remember our IPO research uh, goes way back to the 80s for the book. This is just something we started to look at to try to put like a time frame and percentage around some of these moves. And the reason I'm showing it today, even though it's very preliminary and a small sample size, is it kind of underscores what those all those examples I've been showing you say, that that IPO advance phase um, is pretty quick. So with those caveats, uh, what we found in IPOs that are liquid over the last few years is that the average number of days for that IPO advance is uh, 90 trading days. And because averages are a little misleading when you have a few names skewing, um, I just threw the median in here too. It's a median of 11 weeks. And uh, we also looked at the percentage gains. So 
Um, this is from first trading day low to peak in the IPO advance phase. So uh, keep in mind that even the best trader would never get this type of movement. You know, maybe they'd catch a percentage of this. And the other thing to keep in mind is that a few big winners skew these numbers higher. So uh, we found the, the move to be 129% and then a median of 72%. But names like Upstart that had just amazing runs um, during the last bull market are skewing these numbers higher. So most of the names are a little bit lower than this. Okay, so just some preliminary data. So when I go in to, to trade an IPO advanced phase, I have certain expectations. First of all, when I'm trading mature stocks, you know, they're all watched closely, but they don't have to be watched quite as closely as these names. When I'm trading very volatile IPO advanced phases, I know I can't just put a trade on and kind of walk away and just set alerts. It's something that's going to be need to be monitored very, very carefully until there's a big buffer. And even then, um, they move so quickly, they just need to be monitored very, very closely. So that's my expectation going in. And that's why you'll see I don't trade too many of these at a time. It may just be one because they're so volatile and hard to manage um, and the risk is higher. So two maximum, and that would have to be in a very, very strong, strong market for IPOs, a strong bull market. Um, as I mentioned before, my expectation going in is that I'm going to be shaken out a couple times trying to attempt this trade, though the positive returns could be very fast and um, very lucrative if I time it right. So uh, with strong risk management in a strong bull market, in a liquid name that looks like it has a good story and strong revenue growth, um, I'm going to potentially try a position, even though I know going in that I'm probably going to get stopped out. So my stops are pretty tight going in. I'm going to keep in mind the average true range when I'm trying to enter a name. If it's too wide, I may just choose to pass on it because I want tight stops. Um, and if there is no logical tight stop on the name, it's so volatile, it has these huge swings all the time. I may just pass on that um, because the risk is just too high. I'm going to also keep in mind always the expiration, the lockup expiration date. So um, what I've noticed just in kind of watching it and trading some of these phases, um, it, you know, typically the lockup expires somewhere around six months in. Um, so it could put pressure on the shares, and I've noticed that it does either ahead of time or during, you know, as as the lockup expires. Um, one thing to keep note, though, if it doesn't, that's an interesting sign on the positive. If the shares don't have pressure at that pe time period, that is an interesting positive. So how do I manage risk? Uh, as I mentioned, I'm only going to trade one, maybe two max at a time in this phase and uh, keep average costs low. Uh, we dub the term boss or buy once and sit still. I try to do that always um, in this phase uh, as much as possible. In terms of risking capital, I mean, I have 1% here. That's a total maximum. Um, that's if I get caught in some kind of gap down, unexpected. I'm really going to try to keep my risk per trade much lower than that, um, typically in the 0.3 to 0.5% of capital. Um, and I'm going to be setting my stops in my mind um, with alerts in terms of for every new position, where am I going to stop out of this position? So that's before I enter the position. And as I mentioned, fast sell rules. I'm going to be using faster sell rules um, that we tested in the book, um, also as well as selling into strength during this phase to take profits when I have them. Okay, so um, on the left here, I'm showing a part of the graphic um, from our book, The Life Cycle Trade, and it shows you the Everest and Ascender rules kind of at a high level. Um, those were rules that we tested on super growth stocks. And um, we found that these are can be more effective during this faster phase. So again, when I'm trading this phase, I have profits um, and I see maybe a negative reversal or a parabolic move, I'm going to try to take most, if not all, of my profits into strength. 
I use the 21 day EMA quite a bit. So if I'm still in the name uh, and giving it some room, I'm going to sell on a close below the 21 day EMA. And uh, maybe for like a high conviction name, uh, I may use the full ascender set of rules and you can see them here. So those are the 21 day, the 50 day, and then trying to hold a small portion of the position for a longer move. Um, if I see a parabolic move um, or a reversal or break of that curve, um, I'm likely going to be selling there. And one of the things the Everest rule is described here at a high level, but Eric actually shared during the IPO masterclass the specifics of the Everest rule and what it looks for and how it triggers. So, you know, once that triggers, once we see that kind of parabolic move, gaps, huge price moves after already an extended move, um, the Everest rule looks back two days and sells um, below that point. So again, fast, fast rules for that phase. Because we saw in all those examples, and again, that advance is fast, but then most of the time it gives it back just as fast, if not faster. Okay, so in the next section, I wanted to share with you, since we've recently had uh, a turn and a rally off of the, um, the bear market, um, I wanted to share with you what I've found to be uh, a way to try to identify leaders pretty early in a new rally. And this is one of my favorite screens. Um, I call it the power screen. And you can run it from different spots. Um, typically, I like to run it either from like the first rally day um, and like this. So that would be the market bottom after you've already seen a turn. You're looking back and you're saying, you know, which names have had the highest price move percentage wise um, from that low point, that first rally day. And then I'm looking only at liquid names. So like our research showed liquidity matters. So 20 million average daily um, or better. And I'm going to be running this during a market turn. I'm going to be running this for weekly for, you know, maybe a couple months out. And what I'm looking for is, you know, what are some of the names that are behaving the best? And then I get to research them even further. So, um, and what I found again anecdotally that it sometimes identifies, you know, one or two of the new, couple of the new leaders early. So I'm sharing with you, this screen was an actual screen that I ran. Um, the screen was run March 17th. And what I did was I looked back to the first rally day, which was the end of last year. Kind of that was like the bottom for the, the most recent rally. And I started running it, you know, after the, I believe after the January 6th uh, follow through day. And uh, then I just kept running it periodically. So you can see here, there were a few names that I highlighted and these, this is the price move here. And what's interesting is, you know, if you first look at this, let's say you're sitting there looking at this screen on March 17th, you'd say, wow, you know, these names have already run you know, 60, 76%, 93%. So they've already run quite a bit. Um, so what's interesting is a lot of times these point to names that are going to also continue that run as long as the market environment um, continues. Not all of them, but it may point to a few. So I'm just showing you that it pointed, you know, to NVIDIA pretty early on. So let's say a trader uh, picked it up at that time. And since that time, since the time this screen was run, um, NVIDIA is up another 52% and so forth. The other thing I picked up on this um, was that several of the names that show up on this list that had very powerful moves um, have a, a bit of an AI theme to them. So uh, that was another thing from the screen, but just wanted to share that with you. One thing to keep in mind when I run this screen, I'm looking uh, the liquidity filters in there, and also I'm filtering out anything under $15 a share. So I wanted to show you, since we talked a little bit about that um, AI theme, this is the bots or artificial intelligence ETF. And you can see, this is a weekly chart, you can see that it corrected significantly along with the bear market. Um, you know, bottomed out 
has been rallying, consolidating, rallying, consolidating, and then recently broke out. What caught my attention is um, this volume here on the weekly. So no one knows how long this will continue, but it's you know an area that I've been researching, and so I'm keeping a close close eye here as well. Now I wanted to share with you a few names um, that are on theme for the AI theme. Um, I do have positions in these names, and the reason I'm sharing them, I don't trade just IPOs, I do trade mature stocks as well. Um, so I do own um, these names, and I, we talked about Palantir, um, we talked about NVIDIA showing up on the, um, the power screen, and then Tesla has a presence in AI for their autonomous driving. And Snow is one that's um, attempting this space, and we'll see if it can break out of that. It has been, um, you know, correcting quite a bit with the bear market. It's had a long institutional due diligence phase. We'll see if it works. I don't know. I have, you know, tight stops on my stocks. And, you know, if for some reason they breach that, you know, I may have it and then have to have to sell it um, next week. So it's just names that I feel are on theme with artificial intelligence. Um, that I am uh, ha have accumulated in the portfolio, and we'll see we'll see how they do. Okay, and so in terms of liquid IPOs above the first day close, I wanted to share one more screen with you. Now, we had looked at Next Tracker as an example of why it's important to get in earlier um, in the turn during an IPO base because it's so easy to get stopped out. And I had mentioned that, you know, that's on one of my watch lists just because of this screen. And uh, this screen is something that I run periodically, and it shows me any IPO that is um, liquid, so above 20 million daily, and went IPO'd in the last couple of years. So I'm looking here just from 2021 um, to the present. And what I want to do is just see, you know, which names are actually above their first day close. So this is kind of shocking because these are the only names that are above their first day close. And that's because of the severity of the bear. You know, if we continue railing, uh, we'll start to see more names come onto this list. I think this first one though is a SPAC, but all of these are names that I have on a list um, to research further. And that's because they're showing that they've at this point are above their first day close, which is kind of unique um, after this very severe bear market. So just wanted to share that with you. Well, we've talked a little bit about the different phases and I mentioned the institutional due diligence phase takes some time, right? It's six to 18 months. Um, we looked at a screen that there aren't that many names that are above their, you know, their first day. And the, the stats really bear that out. Um, IPOs can cor do correct significantly, even after they have an IPO advance phase, and a lot of times we'll undercut that entire structure. And what you're seeing here is that they do it pretty quickly. So they may go public and have a short run, but often a majority of the time they're under, they're going to undercut that first day low. And as you can see, I'm showing the stats from the book, the time frame of the book that we published in the book, as well as you know, Eric's updated these numbers for more recently. And because of the severity of the bear, we've seen these numbers get, you know, even larger. So as you can see that 93% of IPOs undercut their first day low within um, 39 weeks. So I just wanted to share that. And also there's no rush really as IPOs start trading publicly there's no reason to rush in like the first day. So as you see, I'm always waiting for that first um, IPO base um, and I'm looking for the technical signs. I have time to research it. And then if I am tra trading that phase, um, I'm gonna be using faster rules because I know in studying the IPOs, 
how quickly they can give up that move. So we started early on with this slide, again, from our research on IPOs. Um, this is the edge that we feel we have in trading IPOs and super growth stocks. So always being aware of like, what phase is this stock in? You know, is it early phase? Um, is it the first mature base, which may have a longer run in the institutional advanced phase? Or is it in this quick phase where fast rules work better? You know, I always try to look at the patterns um, and certain rules have sh are more effective with different patterns. So um, we found that, and we share that in the book, the exact numbers, and we looked at all the super growth stocks and which rules were more effective. Uh, but uh, the patterns are important. The phase is important. I'm always looking for liquidity for the exceptional companies. And then really trying to apply the appropriate sell rules based on all of those factors, particularly the phase um, and the patterns of the name. So just one super growth stock handled well could turn into a life-changing life cycle trade. I wanna acknowledge again that all of the charts that I've used today are uh, from Wanda, uh, William O'Neill and company. And I mentioned the IPO masterclass. We had so much fun working with the Trader Lion team, working with Richard so closely. And uh, it was it was quite a lot of work, I'm gonna be honest, but an amazing process to go through to put all that information together and share it um, with you all. So if you're interested and you didn't catch it before, um, here's some of the information on it. And uh, yeah, I guess I'll turn it over to you, Richard, right? Yeah, perfect. I just want to mention, yeah, it, it was a great community that we built as well with the IPO Masterclass. So I had a ton of fun uh, and learned an immense amount. And it, it doesn't just cover IPOs because each of you kind of shared your individual trading styles, which uh, I thought I thought was really excellent. And I definitely uh, picked up a lot of new things. So uh, thank you so much for giving this presentation, Eve. And we've got a ton of questions to go through um, for Please. anybody watching. Yeah, for anybody watching, uh, this is the time to let me know in the chat what you'd like me to ask Eve. Uh, but to start with, um, would we be able to go back to uh, the AI theme a little bit? Because I know uh, you're super into research and, and looking into individual stocks as well as themes. Um, my question was, once you noticed that AI theme and a few names that were popping up on your radar, sharp, showing large uh, volume and other you know promising technical signs, what did you do to look further into the AI theme and investigate, you know, potential ideas as well as, you know, look into, you know, how long this theme could last? Great question. So I, it's, it's a lot of reading. I've been listening to um, a lot of podcasts from experts on the topic. I've been listening to the CEOs of the companies that I feel are leading in the space or trying to learn which ones are leading in the space. Um, I've been monitoring a list. I have a watch list put together, but it's it's difficult at this stage. It's still, I think, pretty early on. So um, right now, a lot of the names on the list are are larger names, like some of the mega cap names. And and one of the things that dawns on me is that, well, in order to invest in AI, like develop an AI platform. That takes a huge dollar commitment. So, you know, that's why I think some of these mega cap names are starting to move on that, on the promise of AI. But I feel like we're going to have a lot of other names, like newer names that we've never heard of. And maybe when the IPO market um, starts to heat up, the environment's a little better for IPOs. We'll see some new names go public. So really just a lot of reading, a lot of studying, learning the space, learning uh, from experts in the space, and then um, listening in a lot to the CEOs and what they, you know, what they say about their investment in AI, what's their future view, and um, sharing that too with, I have a network of uh, portfolio managers that I meet with regularly, and we share information so important 
um, to have that type of a network and develop that because we share information with each other every week. We have a call, but also when we run across something interesting, uh, we share that, you know, a link maybe to a podcast and say, you know, this is worth listening to. Um, and that's a way to have other people helping and contributing to, to that research as well. So I'm still early. I think, I think it's still early in AI. And I, I think I'm still early in the process as well, trying to understand the potential um, of the space. Yeah, excellent. And are there any kind of go to resources um, in general that you like to, you know, look into when you, you've noticed a new theme or uh, you mentioned, you know, a few that you listen to podcasts with AI, any in particular that you would kind of recommend to the audience here? Well, um, I found I just listened to uh, the Palantir CEO um, talk about, you know, his edge that he feels he has in this space. Uh, I would recommend that. That was a Bloomberg video a couple of days ago. Um, we use Jeffrey's research. Uh, they just um, released a huge uh, paper on the potential in um, in the AI space and the names that may stand to benefit. Um, and they put out some uh, really great research. Those are just a couple of the things that pop into my mind uh, right now. Yeah, excellent. And for my next question, I'm sorry, I'm going to have you go back uh, in your slides here. Would you be able um, to go back to the PLTR daily chart? Um, it was uh, maybe slide 15 or, or so in there. Um, and as you go there, uh, my question is, would you be able to walk through kind of the price and volume characteristics that you're watching within that IPO base? Because it was a really nice, clean example, if I remember correctly. So PLTR back in the IPO base, not, not oh, this is great too. Yeah, yeah, no worries. Okay. Yeah, yeah, so that that first base, could you kind of walk through what you're noticing in both the price movements as well as the volume clues that signal like uh, this is something you should be watching and how how you kind of identify that specific buy point? Oh yes, definitely. So um, right away, what catches my attention is that this action is pretty tight and shallow. So it's unusual for an IPO to have that type of action. And when I see that, that catches my attention. So if you look here in this consolidation, look how low this, this volume is here. And then as it starts to, again, goes tight here, as it starts to move out, you see this volume ramping and, and liquidity is coming in. You know, this first day, you always have to kind of just say, you know, knock that out. But when it starts to approach that kind of volume and you see this ramp, that's going to get my attention, the number of days up. Um, so there, and you can look at relative strength here as well as it's moving out, uh, gave a lot of clues. Now, this is a little lower priced. So, you know, I said before, you know, 15, I try to screen. Sometimes I drop it as low as 10. Um, you know, I don't like to trade low priced stocks um, typically. So this is a little bit, this is a little bit low here in terms of price, but the certainly the accumulation was there, the quiet volume and the consolidation, and then the power on the move out. Yeah, perfect. And now going to that mature base, could you kind of talk through the, the clues you're watching there to, to indicate that, you know, something substantial is going on and we might be starting that turn within the institutional due diligence phase. Okay, yes. So first of all, um, it's been over two years. Um, it's not, this This correction's huge. And if there wasn't a bear market, I wouldn't like this correction, right? I mean, I still don't like it, but it's basically following the market, right? And it's going through a due diligence phase. So that's something that I take note of. What's the market environment while the name is doing this? And then here's, here's the daily and here's the weekly. So let's go to that. Mm -hmm. uh, what gets my attention is it, it shows some power right away. Can't get moving. But as it's consolidating, again, it's going quieter. Um, and then um, I talk more about the super gaps in um, the IPO masterclass. And, but one of the things I, I watch for is a huge gap on earnings. So, and what's the catalyst for that? Like what's what's the surprise? Uh, what's the news? And then what's the reaction? And here you have a, a super positive reaction to earnings um, and you have the volume come in. So that's important. The size of the move and the volume. And then 
it holds it pretty well right after the gap. So it never breaches the gap day low. It holds the move um, and then starts to follow through. So when I see that follow through, that's a positive. Um, on the weekly, I saw these like tighter weeks in here, mm -hmm. um, the strong previous rally and then this kind of like double bottom it didn't quite shake out here but it still shook out it it went tight and then the power of the volume on the breakout and then i also like to look for um not that it's just viable at that moment but if you see five six seven weeks up in a row closing and it's early in the process it doesn't always but Sometimes that signals a, a leader and it may need to consolidate before it starts moving again. But I always take notice of um, particularly six or more consecutive weeks up in a row. And when I'm looking at daily too, I'm looking for consecutive daily days up. So it just kind of shows the demand. Now, one of the things here, let's go back here. This has a lot of overhead. Now, some of it is older. So uh, that it's less likely to be very smooth sailing, right? Um, but so I, I do keep that in mind. Uh, it's going to be volatile, even if it works, if it can come all the way out of here and move out um, and works beyond what it has already. Um, it's not going to be smooth sailing because you have you have some disgruntled holders in here, right? Um, so that's something to keep in mind. And, and that's been the case. Um, it's hard to get positioned in a new rally after a bear market because, um, you know, you see a lot of that. I, I've seen a lot of that where, you know, one day, you know, you're up 10 percent, the next day you're down, you know, 8 percent. And the name looks fine when you look back on a weekly. There's going to be a lot of volatility because the bulls and bears are still fighting it out. Yeah, perfect. No, I, I love that breakdown of the price and volume action. Um, and, you know. Looking at this chart, it's obviously still in its institutional due diligence phase, um, right. but now we've kind of got, you know, maybe a potential catalyst with this new theme developing, shaping things up. Um, could you kind of talk about, you know, what's going on behind the scenes in this institutional due diligence phase that kind of develops this basing structure? And uh, I know you, you mentioned you look for increasing revenue growth, uh, but are you also kind of interested if a stock, you know, first becomes profitable? during its institutional due diligence phase and starts, you know, seeing a move up the right hand side. Yes, that's a great point. Yes, because the the numbers that were reported on the earnings call um, were, I believe, the catalyst and then the potential for the for the future. But what I'm looking for um, during this institutional due diligence phase and really what's happening is at first it's going from, I think, weaker hands, shorter traders. And if it's a high quality name, it's being it's starting to be accumulated by institutions. And I'm looking for signs of that from a technical perspective, you know, a theme perspective, you know, as they report the numbers, I'm looking at the numbers as well. So the more factors I can see confirming that, um, the more conviction I'll have in, in the name. But again, I'm going to go based on the technical. So if I take a position and I'm wrong, which I'm wrong frequently, um, I'm going to get stopped out and maybe it was just a bad timing or maybe it's the wrong name. Right. Um, but, you know, it it can sometimes just be timing and I may need to take another try at it. Um, but what I'm looking for is signs of accumulation. So we went through some of that as well with the volume. So as you know, it time wise, it takes a while. And because it's a bear market, um, I'm going to say you know, this is not ideal, this this depth of this IDDP, um, but I'm going to keep in mind that it was during a bear market, and that happens sometimes. But now, based on the lat from the last earnings call, it, it's kind of changed character, right? So what I'm looking for is a change of character as well. Are the institutions starting to accumulate? And so far, I'm seeing signs of that in this name, uh, based on the volume. I'm also going to look at, you know, what now that's a lagging indicator in terms of what funds are high quality funds starting um, to buy the name uh, and what are some of the projections for the particular theme the company is in. And 
What type of a lead does the company have in their um, in their expertise in their area? And um, as you know, just I'm trying to get a sense for initially how far ahead of the competition in this case is Palantir in the AI space. So all of those factor in to my decisions, and those are some of the things I look for in the phase. Yeah, that that's a really fantastic answer. Uh, there's a good question from Yaron, uh, which has to do with uh, the IPO advanced phase more. And it might be helpful to go back to, I think, the Mobileye example with the J-hooks. Um, okay. And the question is, uh, what is the earliest point at which you'll consider trading an IPO a few days or weeks, or you don't define a specific time range? And it might be kind of good to go over the, the J-hooks a little bit and talk about you know how you identify the pivot and what you might look for right before that pivot occurs. Sure. Um, I don't have an exact um, minimum number of days, but usually, you know, it's a couple weeks, like just anecdotally, um, that's what it, usually if it's forming a short consolidation, I'm looking for at least a, a couple of weeks in there. Mm -hmm. um, though sometimes you can see a high tight flag and I'm sure I have examples where I've traded them a little faster than that because the pattern is so compelling. Um, but usually like two plus uh, weeks in. Um, and here, the hook pattern, I share the details of the trades and I don't have them right in front of me in the IPL masterclass. But I did try this early on and some of this volatility just shook me out. Because right. um, you could see like if you're buying somewhere in this area, it has this huge run and it comes all the way back even if you're early. Um, you know, that's definitely a, a, a shake, at least it was for me. So I'm expecting that. Um, in terms of the hook pattern, what I'm looking for is the stock's been going down for, you know, maybe a week or two, uh, and then starts to turn and form this U shape. A lot of times it coincides with like the 10 day or the 21 day EMA. And then there's some type of resistance that it needs to get through and it and it kind of moves through that. Um, so when it coincides with the moving average, it's nice because you can set kind of some logical stops for that. But again, the expectation in this phase is that I'll be stopped out. So then I uh, tried again. I, this was early December. Um, and then... This one was a little unusual because it was acting a bit like a stair stepper. So I did add to this, um, sold a majority into strength, and then tried to hold the last piece. And you can see what happened to that with a mental capital preservation, which is a line in the sand. You know, once I'm profitable on a trade, I don't want to give it all back. Um, I mean, sometimes I'm willing to round trip um, a portion of a position, but usually I'm setting a, a mental capital preservation where line in the sand where I want to retain like at least half or maybe 35% of the profit if it's like a small core position. So um, so I may try to hold on to a piece of it and take profits on the rust uh, into strength. So this one, you know, this is a shakeout, but now one to, to keep an eye on. So hopefully I've answered the question. Did I answer the question, Richard? Yeah, I think you did. And I saw a few uh, questions and comments about, you know, handling volatility during the IPO advance phase. And I think Mobileye, you know, just looking at that chart, there's a lot of wide ranges in there. Yes. Uh, how, how do you handle that with your position sizing, um, your initial stop loss? Like how, how tight do you like to keep it? And also, how do you just kind of handle that psychologically, seeing your stock move up and down so much, you know, uh, even over the course of a day or, or over the course of a week? Great question. Okay, so uh, one at a time is, is or two max, because they have to be watched so carefully. Mm -hmm. Smaller position size. You know, so, um, you know, this was still unclear. I know, are we in a bear market? Are we moving into a bull market? Um, so my position sizing was smaller and smaller because I'm trading the IPO advance phase. So I know if I put on a huge position or a normal size position, I'm not going to handle it well, you know, because I won't be able to withstand some of this volatility. So that and selling some into strength. So even if I'm trying to hold on to a piece and I know I've already locked in some profits, 
um, that get, that helps with my mental capital, the psychology of how I'm handling the tree. I mean, I've tried sometimes in the, you know, even if I have huge conviction in the name, I'm going to size it smaller in these phases because I know otherwise I'll mishandle the trade because of the volatility. And also, I don't want to have that type of risk because, you know, these are more likely to, you know, they can have at certain points secondaries, you know, huge gap downs. They're more volatile. Some names are not yet in institutional quality hands. They're going to have more volatility. So that's the way I address it. It helps me with the psychology of the trade, smaller position size. In terms of stops, I usually I set my stops pretty tight. Like in the research, we found, um, you know, with IPOs, you want to give it a little bit more room. So what I do is I still set them tightly, but I'm prepared that I might get stopped out a few times, and I'm willing to try again. Now, some some people on the team. Uh, you know, set their smaller position sizes and set their stops in the 10% range. Mine are usually tighter, like 5% on an IPO, somewhere in that range, three to five. I always want to, for each trade, I never want to be, uh, I want to try to average in 0.3 to 0.5 of capital um, losses on my stop losses. Yeah, perfect. I, I, I know there are a bunch of questions about stops, so it's definitely helpful. Uh, one last question. Uh, this one is from Greg Morton, uh, an IPO uh, aficionado in his own right. A uh, question for Eve. Uh, do you pay attention to the quiet period expiration at all, uh, which is the first 25 days after the IPO in which underwriters can't issue uh, coverage reports? Um, I don't so much. I, I go based on the technical action, but I kind of keep that in mind. You know, sometimes the stock will... Um, will move quite a bit, either up or down, once all of that information is released and each of the firms take a position on whether to buy, sell, or hold. But I go based on the, the technical action. But I'm not going to take action just based on the fact that that date's coming up. The same thing with, um, I know we're not talking about the lockup, but the same thing with lockup. If I'm aware that the lockup is coming, it won't necessarily make me change how I'm going to how I'm going to handle the trade. I'm just going to be aware of it. And I'm going to still uh, follow my rules. Yeah, fantastic. Uh, Eve, thank you so much for your time. Uh, thank you all for those excellent questions. Uh, I think this is this is really great. Um, Eve, any last kind of thoughts that you'd like to share uh, with everybody watching about IPOs, trading them, or you know, further resources that they can explore? Well, there's just going to be a tremendous amount of opportunities out there, um, especially after a bear market. Right. So what I'm doing right now is just keeping my watch lists um, very, very watching them very closely, the stocks, researching great time, trying positions as they start to work. I'm I'm adding some more. So it's easy to get frustrated in a bear market. But one of the things um, Bill always was was very optimistic. I think he said something like, I, I've never met a successful pessimist. So true. Stay optimistic. The opportunities are going to be out there and uh, good luck. Perfect. Yeah, I think that's a great spot to end it. Uh, Eve, thank you again for, for your time and for that excellent presentation. Uh, to everybody watching, I hope you guys enjoyed. Uh, if you did, please go ahead and leave a like down below on the stream. Subscribe if you haven't yet.